So that's just to summarize then, basically, in patients with myeloma, we've established uh, that there is disruptions to how that immune system works, not only in terms of its protection against infection, but also in trying to clear the myeloma. And this includes both directly and indirectly impairing or hampering the immune system, including through the microenvironment. Novel therapies do have the potential to, to break that vicious circle, but we do need to have a better understanding of the, the genetics behind an individual's immune response, because that may well delineate who's going to be best served by which approach. Uh, and of course, some of the data that I've shown is, is, is actually the, the work of others in my group rather than myself. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to work with, uh, with these fine people, and we obviously do collaborations both within Leeds and also the virus work, we'll be working with Richard Vile in the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and more than happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Professor Cook. Um, so it sounds to me like, yep, the immune system is this incredible, I guess, organism within the body that's highly evolved and adaptive. But that horrible cancer cell, that myeloma cell, is just as smart and it's been able to manipulate that immune system to meet its own ends. But the good news is we're fighting back. We've turned the corner and we're beginning to understand a little bit more about the immune system. We're unrivaling, un, um, uncoupling the complexity of it. And, and what you showed in that last section there is there's a number of immune therapy strategies some very similar, some very different, um, that, that may just work. And if we can learn about what the genetic drivers are of the immune system, alongside the evolving understanding of the genetics contained within the cell, then taken together, that could be a really potent combination of treatments that is attacking both the, the cell, but also the immune system around about the cell to really mount a a really you know, significant response against the myeloma. And I think for me, the thing that is really encouraging is that harnessing that immune system may prevent the myeloma from coming back. And, and that to me, I think is one of the biggest opportunities that we have in immune therapy is that we can combine it with current therapies to eradicate the disease and then hopefully work out how to stop it coming back. And that's that's really exciting. Um, okay, so we've been inundated with questions as I, as I predicted. Um, so they're gonna come up on your uh, screen and I will just um, uh, try and summarize some of these questions for, for, for Gordon. So the first question from George C is, and thanks George for your question, is does not the recent loss of approval of lenalidomide Revlimid by the Cancer Drugs Fund cause a major setback to the progress of immuno immunology as treatment for myeloma? Um, so obviously this, this is a very uh, current issue that's facing patients out there uh, with myeloma, is what, what does the Cancer Drugs Fund decisions mean? And this is something that, that both you and I, Erica, are, are working very hard in the background on behalf of patients to try and you know, bring this back to, to the foreground. Um, the Revlimid that was taken off by the Cancer Drugs Fund is not all of Revlimid, it's only Revlimid second line. So where most patients will be experiencing Revlimid will be third line, that's no different, and that's been nice approved. So therefore, that decision by the Cancer Drugs Fund will affect a minority of patients. The decision by the Cancer Drugs Fund to remove pomalinamide will have a bigger impact and affect more patients because in England at least that was our access to pomalinamide and we've got work to do to try and bring that back into to the clinic. And there are other drugs that can stimulate the immune system in that space, such as thalidomide for example, the parent drug of, of, of uh, that group Revlimid and pomalinamide. So we have other opportunities. It's a setback in terms of how we, we, we manage patients. But in terms of the immunotherapy side of things, it, it is not going to hamper our ability to take things further forward at this moment in time. We will come back to this, don't worry. 
but I'm confident that, that, that we will work to improve that system. So we'll have uh, some confidence that the system will enable access rather than disable it as it does currently. Okay, so the next question from Jill A. Is there any danger of immune therapy treatments accidentally triggering an autoimmune response? I'm asking because I have, I won't even. Your goodness. Yeah, thank you. And I've also <laughs> had autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So I think that's a very good question, uh, Gordon. And I think for, for, for us in the past, that we've always been a bit concerned that for people that maybe take immune boosting therapies, that you may end up accidentally boosting a part of the immune system that actually is helpful to the myeloma rather than unhelpful to the, my, the myeloma. Yeah. So, so first of all, it's an excellent question, Jill A. Um, obviously, coming at it from, uh, you know, from a personal standpoint. So, I mean, Sjogren's syndrome is a, a condition where an individual's own immune system has, for whatever reason, decided to attack normal tissues that gives rise to, to the problem. Um, and that's what I was talking about earlier about the checks and balances within the immune system, so that the immune system deals with a problem but doesn't overdeal with it. And that's what the regulatory cells are supposed to control. That's what these checkpoint inhibitors control. So as Jill has, has, has raised the issue, if you tinker, interfere, manipulate with that control system, might you be in danger of un unbalancing the whole immune system? And it's a very real possibility that we have to be mindful of when we devise our clinical trials in immunotherapy. The trials that have been done so far in uh, solid organ cancers using the checkpoint blockade or using oncolytic viruses haven't to date shown any significant uh, concerns over the developing of, of the autoimmune response, auto being self. But it's something, Jill, that we we're going to have to be mindful of and be very wary uh, going forward to make sure that what we do is, first of all, no harm, and secondly, we, we do some good. And, and I think that, I mean, it is a good question, and I think it is, it just underpins the complexity. Um, thinking about, you know, immune genetics and drug discovery in, in the immune therapy is going to be a little bit more complex than what we've been used to. So, okay. Right, next question we have on screen is, are immune therapy and immunization the same thing from Gareth? Okay, Gareth. Um, in actual fact, I mean, immunization is a form of immunotherapy. So immunization is specific. What you're doing is you're trying to educate the memory component of your immune system so that when it sees whatever again, then it will respond quicker. So it's a form of immunotherapy. It's not usually described that way because it is, as it says, immunizations. But in the context of trying to, to deal with cancer, what you're trying to do is you're trying to use treatment strategies that will stimulate the immune system to get rid of the cancer cells, which it should have done in the first place. But if it did, then the person wouldn't have uh, it wouldn't have the cancer. So you can use immunizations in that setting. As I mentioned, immunocin is, is something that is in early phase trials as a, as a vaccine in smoldering myeloma. So that's a form of immunotherapy. So it's not the same thing. Immunization is a form of immunotherapy, but there are many others which I tried to describe this afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Gordon. Okay, next question is from Lorraine. Um, so I've unsuccessfully tried two forms of chemo, but my body could not tolerate the treatment. I was excited when I read about immune therapy, but I see that high dose chemo and stem cell transplant are required prior to the immune therapy treatment. Is there no way that the immune therapy treatment can be given without the chemo? So again, Lorraine, that's, that's a great question. Um, let me first of all explain the reason why immunotherapy schedules try to couple to, to the stem cell transplant is twofold. One, the stem cell transplant reduces the myeloma to its minimum. And it, it, I mean, this is a balance of forces. So if you want the immune system to kill off myeloma, you've got to give the immune system the advantage of numbers. That is, reduce the myeloma to its minimum. That then means the immune system outnumbers the myeloma and gets at the upper hand. The second thing is, is that in the aftermath of the stem cell transplant, 
we and others have shown that that's probably when an individual with myeloma's immune system is probably at its most robust. It's not saying it's the only time, but those two features make that an attractive setting to try immunotherapy. Now, it's not the only setting, and one of the things I showed there with the MUC11 protocol is actually in patients, that's not anything to do with stem cell transplants, that's in patients who are losing the impact of either Revlimid or, or pomalidomide um, and trying to harness the immune response in that setting. So the two are linked for a good reason, but not the only way of dealing with things. I hope that answers things. Thanks. Yeah, we're getting some great questions. It's, it's, it's amazing. So, okay, so Jim D, given the role of vaccines in boosting the immune system, is a vaccine for myeloma a possibility or a cul-de-sac? That's actually a very intuitive question. So Jim D, um, I started doing my, my PhD studies in the 1990s. The aim of that was to develop a vaccine, but I won wondered why is the immune system not doing this on its own accord? So it brought me back to the, the premise, how can you fix something if you don't know how it's broken? And what I've done in my research group I've done ever since is actually keep finding new ways that the immune system doesn't recognize myeloma. And if it can't recognize it, it can't kill it. So the vaccines will be a part of the strategy for immunotherapy, but it won't be the only strategy. And that's because you can stimulate the immune system with a vaccine, but if the immune system is sitting in a hostile environment, it's never going to get the maximum benefit from that vaccine. So we're going to have to do things to weaken the niche that the myeloma has. We're going to have to do things that strengthen the immune system to respond and then give it a target, give it a taster, and that's with the vaccines. So on their own, I think you're right, Jim, I think that's probably a cul-de-sac, but it's part of a strategy that involves other ways of setting the scene correctly. Then I think vaccines will have a role to play. Thanks, Gordon. So the next question um, from Nick is, um, how long might it be before we can hope to see immune therapies offered as mainline treatment? And what hope is there of the NHS funding them in the foreseeable future? And again, there's quite a lot of questions coming in about concerns that, yet yeah, we've got a lot of exciting things in the pipeline, but is there the willingness on behalf of the NHS to fund them? But also, Gordon, as you know, it's not just about the NHS's willingness to fund it, it's can we trust drug companies to do the right research, to generate the right data and information that we need to make good decisions, and are we going to have the right mechanisms to price drugs better than we have done in the past? I think that's as important as a willingness of the NHS to fund. So, yeah, again, you know, it's another great question. So. The difficulty is at the moment is that a lot of the immunotherapy research is done by academic institutions or supported by you know great great organisations like Myeloma UK. Um, scaling that up into a therapy that then can be rolled out across the NHS does take investment. Now, perhaps you know grant funding organisations like Myeloma UK, Cancer Research UK can then do that in partnership with with industry. Then there is some ownership of those developments will then keep down some of the costs. In terms of funding, well, it's difficult, Nick, to, to, to predict how that would be funded going forward. Yes, if it's, if, a, if it's a drug that's been developed by a company, then they will want to see a return on their investment. But if it's developed in partnership with, uh, with academia, then the, 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 there's going to be less monies to, to be recovered. One thing I would say is that what I said during the talk in terms of cellular therapy, allogeneic stem cell transplantation is a form of is immunotherapy. And that's something that has been funded by the NHS ever since its inception 20, 30 years ago. And a standard donor transplant is about £100,000 worth of clinical care before any complications set in. So there is a high-tech, high-end level of care that the NHS funds without quibble. So the NHS does find the resources for treatments that do have a proven benefit. The difficulty comes when you have new drugs coming to market with 
it, it, quite significant price tags, and that's a difficulty for the NHS. I think what I would say at the moment is we've got to develop partnerships to move forward, and those partnerships do include industry, to do the right research, find the right treatment, find which people that will benefit the most so we get our best value for our buck, and then we'll worry about how NHS will fund it. Thanks. Thanks, Gordon. And, and, and obviously, this is an ongoing topic and, and issue. And, and obviously, myself and colleagues are available at any time on email or on the info line to talk through, you know, any concerns around sort of this, this issue around funding of, of, of new treatments. OK, so I think we've got quite a, a big question here, Gordon. So take a deep breath. Okay, so daratumumab and elatuzumab, which you covered off in your presentation, are showing incredible promise and could be game changers for myeloma. So how would you, as a consultant, choose when the precision medicine or personalized treatment process of genome sequencing to test for your subtype and applying the optimal drug is not yet available? So that first part of the question is, you, you, you mentioned in your presentation, one size does not fit all. Not every treatment works in every patient, but without the ability to determine what drug works in what patients, how will you choose between elotuzumab and daratumumab if, if that is a clinical decision? So let's do that part first, and then we'll come back to part B. Yeah, so, so clearly, Bob, you've been thinking about this. Um, so first and foremost, the... the you're right when you say that we aren't at the level of being able to determine precision medicine or personalized medicine at this point. And our subtype uh, strategies are based around the genetic tests that we can do. And that's helpful. It's a pointer, but it's not absolute. And at this moment in time, there is no evidence that tells you that elotuzumab will work for this subtype or daratumumab will work for that subtype. So to answer your question there, to be pragmatic about this, in the absence of an ability to, to do precision medicine, and that includes disease stratification and immune genomic stratification that I mentioned earlier, then you could consider elotuzumab and daratumumab rather than being competitors as being available options. In much the same way as thalidomide is not a competitor of lenalidomide, it's another option within that group of drugs. Elotuzumab has a different target to daratumumab, and therefore you would not necessarily be choosing one over the other. You might be choosing a sequence of one versus a sequence of the other. For example, elotuzumab before daratumumab, or daratumumab before elotuzumab. These are two very new agents that are showing promise, but we don't have enough data to say it works, this one works in that disease, that one works in that subclass category of disease. So the actual correct answer to your question, how would the consultant choose? He would choose which one he could get his hands on, would be the way to answer that question if we were really being honest at the moment, because these drugs are not available as yet. And they will come online, not together, but staggered by a, a period of time. So I suspect clinicians will be choosing what is available. Over the course of time, we will get a better idea as to which patient will respond better. And in terms of these antibodies in particular, this may be one of the places where the immune genomic profiling might be more relevant for a variety of scientific reasons that I could go into for MD who's remotely interested. Okay, thanks. And, and just I'll, I'll try and maybe ask being a different way, Gordon, is that in the absence of um, um, sort of genetic stratified information, is there anything that you can determine based on how patients respond to previous treatments as to how they might respond to future treatments? So what we know is over time is that we know some patients do well on alkylators, some don't, some do well on PIs, some don't, some do well on IMIDs, some don't. Can, can we use that previous response to treatment as a way to try and guide future treatment strategies in the absence of biomarkers or genetic information? So, and so and Bob, how does that relate to elotuzumab and daratumumab? So, 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 Bob, that's another great question. And again, the problem is, is that the, the, the data doesn't exist, is, is the short answer. 
One thing to think about is daratumumab and elotuzumab are a new class of drug. They are antibodies. And in your question, you mentioned protosome inhibitors and, and responses to imids and things like that. Then you, you can't, that's comparing an apple with an orange. The only thing that I would think about is that what I said earlier is that the immunomodulatory drugs may well boost up your immune system that might make the antibody therapy more effective. So that would be the only thing that I could slot into your question that could possibly fit there. But the bottom line is that so far the data has not been analyzed in terms of how well somebody responded to previous medications and how predictive that will be of responding to antibodies. That data will come, Bob, but it's not there at the moment. Thanks, Gordon. So unfortunately, everybody, um, we're, we're out of time. Um, so I think it's been an exceptionally insightful uh, webinar. And, and thanks, Gordon, for making what is actually a very, very complex subject uh, sound um, not so complex. Um, I think what we've done is we've had a sort of brief insight into how the immune system works that's fascinating. You touched upon what goes wrong in myeloma. And again, that's quite complex. But you're beginning to unravel that and better understand what goes wrong in the immune system. And as a consequence of that increased understanding, we can then drive forward and develop treatment strategies that will either harness key parts of the immune system to fight back against the myeloma or kickstart bits that have been uh, switched off previously. What we know is that, that that research is going to be complex and it's going to take stamina and courage and collaboration and investment between all stakeholders to make sure that that we do a good job in making these potential breakthroughs available for, for, for patients. What we need to do ahead of time is make sure that the policy environment that dictates um, um, funding for new treatments is in place so that we don't have the same barriers and issues that we've had in the last decade in terms of getting access to new therapies. And I'm pretty confident we can work, we can work that out, but it's not going to be um, easy. I think the other thing to mention is that actually the UK, and particularly Gordon, sort of leads the way globally in terms of immune therapy in myeloma. It's a relatively new area in which many, many experts have not been interested in for many years. So I think the UK is well placed actually to lead the way globally um, in immune therapy in myeloma. And if we can then dovetail that in with the other genetic research that we've been doing at the ICR, previously with Gareth Morgan and now with Martin Kaiser, it puts the UK in a really powerful position to bring these two research concepts together and then test new combinations of immune therapy and epigenetic drugs in the clinical trial network. So that for me is really really exciting and really promising. What we've got to do is fix the bit at the other end and make sure the NHS has a willingness to pay for that innovation. So thank you very much, uh, Gordon, again. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you to everybody who's taken time out of their busy schedules to join the webinar, and I hope it's been interesting and informative, and I would encourage you to uh, sign up to take part in future webinars. So thank you very, very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.